Well, welcome everybody. This is uh, session seven of our class called Understanding the Forerunner Call, and this session is entitled uh, Forerunners as Messengers, as end time messengers. So that's what we want to look at in this session. Uh, let me just say as we begin, uh, it's been a real encouragement to me as we have been teaching uh, these sessions and having the discussions as a part of our Forerunner School. Uh, how uh, involved and how much each and every one uh, has contributed. It's been a real uh, sense of blessing to me. So I did want to just take a moment as we begin to just to say thanks for uh, each of you and your participation and how you have taken these teachings to heart and uh, so seriously. It's been a real encouragement uh, to me. So. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to, to say that as we get started. Uh, before we have a prayer for this session, let me do a little bit of review just to kind of make sure we understand uh, where we're headed and where we've been on this class. Because this class, Understanding the Forerunner Call, uh, establishes the foundation for everything else we will be doing. Uh, there are a lot of other topics that we'll be discussing in, in this school, the Forerunner School, but understanding the forerunner call lays the foundation. It is the, the why and the what uh, of why we're doing a forerunner school and what's involved in it. So it lays a foundation, important foundation that we can build upon uh, as we raise up ourselves or God raises us up uh, as forerunners anointed by the spirit and the power of Elijah. So it's a very important class. I want to just continue to encourage everybody to really dig into this, uh, into this class, into the, all the different sessions, read the notes, watch the videos, or listen to the audios, be a part of the uh, either the Zoom discussion meetings or the live uh, in-person meeting or the WhatsApp if you have not access to either one of those. Uh, all of those are, are really uh, very important to uh, add to that we lay the teaching, but then Every joint, as it says in Ephesians chapter four, five, chapter four, every joint, what every joint supplies helps. So discussion is very important uh, to all of this. So uh, this class is important. Um, now, what we've done so far, the first five sessions uh, of the class lay a foundation for what the forerunner call is. <coughs> it, uh, we looked at the book of Malachi, we looked at the life of Elijah and the ministry of Elijah and John the Baptist. We, we, we looked at uh, Luke 1, 16 and 17 in a lot of detail, talking about what it means to turn people to Christ, what it means to make ready a people prepared for the Lord, and what it means to be anointed with the Spirit and the power of Elijah. So that was the first five sessions that laid a foundation. With session six, we began to make a little bit of a shift. Uh, in session six, we talked about the forerunner call. Above all else is to be a voice, uh, be a voice into the church uh, and be a voice into the culture, uh, be a voice into even the governmental systems and uh, be a voice to God related to all of those things through prayer and intercession. So the importance of being a voice. And the point, one of the points there was that, it, that just anointed with the spirit and power of Elijah is not for the purpose of laying hands upon the sick or uh, casting out demons or personal prophecy or any of those kind of power gifts of the Holy Spirit that we often think about. Uh, although those may accompany uh, our ministry, I'm not saying they won't, but the point of the forerunner call is not those things. It is to be a voice. It is to be a voice into uh, issues related to the church first and then beyond that into other uh, aspects of our culture. So that was session six. Now, in session seven through 10, this is session seven, but in session seven through 10, we'll be looking at different specific functions of the forerunner call, specific functions of the forerunner call. Like in this session, we will look at in forerunners as messengers, as end time messengers. In the next session, we will look at forerunners as mas wise master builders. 
Uh, and then in 9, we'll look at forerunners as intercessors and spiritual warriors. And in 10, we'll look at forerunners as friends of the bridegroom. So that's kind of where we're headed for the next four uh, sessions. So let's have a prayer. And then we'll get into the discussion of forerunners as end time messengers. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to speak. We thank you for each and every student who will listen to this and watch this. And we ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be upon me. I pray that you would take me out of the way completely and that you would minister through me your heart, your words to your people. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're looking at forerunners as messengers. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the need for end time messengers. Uh, John the Baptist was above all else. He was a messenger of the Lord to prepare the way for Christ's first coming, his earthly ministry, his, uh, his earthly ministry at his first coming. Uh, this is what Mark, the Gospel of Mark, records about, about John, John the Baptist. As it is written in the Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger, speaking of John the Baptist, ahead of you who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So we, you see in there that uh, he's talking about John the Baptist being a messenger and it also alludes to him being a voice. But we're talking about in this session, messenger. The Greek word that is translated messenger in that passage refers to both men and angels, uh, but it carry, and it carries the meaning of one sent to announce, uh, to make known the purposes of God and to execute God's purposes. Uh, so it's one who, who announces and executes God's purposes. Um, and so, you know, consistent with this, John the Baptist prepared the way by announcing that, the, that Jesus was coming on the scene. He did a lot more than that, but he announced that. So we see this role of the messenger as one who announces the, uh, the coming of something, who creates an expectancy uh, for this new thing that is coming, who one who clarifies, uh, uh, you know, even with John the Baptist, and we maybe deal with this more in a minute, but uh, even with him, you know, he said when he was ministering, he saw Jesus, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins uh, of the world. Now, to us, that's very normal, and, uh, but back in those days, Many were expecting a uh, Messiah to come and overthrow Roman oppression. They were looking more for Jesus to be the lion of the tribe of Judah, whereas John said he's coming as a lamb. Uh, it might have probably did uh, raise up some questions there, but he clarified, he, he explained these things. And so messengers have that role of introducing, uh, introducing and inviting and announcing and clarifying uh, that things that God is putting in their hearts for a new season uh, and a new time and a new work of the Holy Spirit that is coming. When I say new, I'm not talking about anything that's not biblical. I want to make sure we understand that. I'm not speaking of any extra biblical type of understanding. We're talking about things that are in the scriptures but are being unfolded, maybe mysteries that have been held, uh, unveiled, not been uh, unveiled in the past that are being uh, unveiled in this time. So we won't get into all that right now. But John the Baptist was a messenger. Uh, Elijah also was a messenger, a little bit different uh, role than John the Baptist, but he was a messenger. You know, when he gathered the, uh, the people there, he had first initiated the drought that was coming upon the land through a prophetic word. Uh, and he said, it's not going to rain except by my word. He, what was he doing? He was uh, creating an expectancy that something needed to change. Uh, so he was functioning as a messenger. Then also he gathered the people uh, together and he said, if Yahweh is God, follow him. In other words, he was inviting them back, in this case, back to the true foundational scriptures where they had drifted far, far, far away from them into Baal and Asherah worship. So he was calling them back to that as a messenger. Uh, we see also with Elijah uh, in 1 Kings 21 where we see um, 
Ahab and Jezebel stealing Naboth's vineyard and then having him murdered. And then Elijah comes on the scene and he declares judgment upon them. He declares that because of this, that, Ahab, that uh, Ahab's entire line would be wiped out and that Jezebel would be killed. And of course, both of those things took place uh, when Jehu became king. And so he was functioning as a, uh, as a messenger. Now, in the same way that John the Baptist, in the same way that, uh, that Elijah operated as messengers, end time forerunners will also function uh, as messengers uh, of, of the Lord uh, in, in, to introduce and, and invite people into a new expression in the context of what God is saying in these end times to prepare the church, uh, primarily to prepare the church for what is coming on the scene for what they need to be, what the church needs to be, how it needs to be different, how it needs to be prepared. Uh, so uh, end time messengers are needed just as much. You know, we, we see that in the book of Malachi. We've already discussed these scripture verses, but Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, Malachi writes, Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to the te temple, even the messenger. Now this messenger, the second one he's referenced, is to Christ uh, of the covenant in whom you delight. Uh, so there's a lot more to that, but we won't take the time there. But God sends messengers before Christ or before the Lord comes because you can't endure. Who can endure the day of his coming? And so God sends in his love, in his grace, in his mercy, he sends messengers uh, to wake people up, to invite them, to clarify, to create expectancy, so that they'll be made ready when, ultimately in our situation, when Christ comes, but not even before that, be made ready for all the various issues that are coming in the context of his second coming. Many, many issues that are, are there. Um, and so what I've established so far is that there is a need uh, in the body of Christ, in this hour, in this time, for end time messengers. And one of the roles of forerunners is to be an end time messenger. Now, Let's do, I want to set the context here. This will be related to this session and the next, actually. I want to look at the Apostle Paul and how he ministered because Paul ministered first as a messenger and then as a wise master builder, which we'll look at in the next session. He ministered first as a messenger and then as a wise master builder. Um, so let's look at that. Of course, we know that he called himself a wise master builder. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 is clear there. We're not, we'll, we'll deal with that a little bit more maybe in the next session. We won't go to there now. But he, So he said, I'm a wise master builder. But he also was a messenger sent by the Lord to introduce the new covenant into uh, the Jewish people and then ultimately into the Gentiles. So he introduced it as a messenger and he helped create a spiritual environment for that theme, that, ver that message to be accepted and bear fruit as a wise master builder. He did both. Now let's look at this. Uh, if you look at the book of Acts, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at uh, a little bit here in Acts chapter 13, uh, on his first missionary journey, now what I'm trying to show is how he went as a, a messenger and then... Uh, he went as a master builder. If you look at his journey, he, you know, he went on, this is not the first place he went, but he went to Pisidian Antioch, uh, and then he went there, to, and where did he go? He went to the synagogue uh, there. So he went to where believers, worshipers of Yahweh were gathered. He went there, uh, and he began to invite them into a new way of relating to God. For introducing Christ as their Messiah. So what did he do? He went there and he preached the gospel. He preached Christ. He preached Christ and he preached him crucified. You can see it in Acts chapter 13, 
starting with about verse 14, and it's a, quite a bit of uh, almost the whole chapter, if not the whole chapter of Acts 13, deals with that. So he dealt with all those, uh, all those issues. He, he went first to the people of God, and he invited them into a new way of relating uh, to God. Uh, now we see that some received it, uh, verse 42, uh, and, Paul, and as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept beg begging that they th these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. But then some of the Jews, the next verse, uh, got upset about it, uh, were urging them to continue, but then a little bit later, not the next verse, but they, some else, some were getting upset about it. So anyway, what we see, we see the role of Paul as a messenger. He went to where the people of God were, invite, were assembled, and he spoke to them and invited them into something that God had initiated in this, this that season. But that was, that was not the only place uh, he did that. Uh, if you look at Acts, and I'll not read all these passages, but I'll quote them. They're in your notes, and you can look at them. But because I want to, what I want to do is I want to establish this as the pattern of how messengers and wise master builders work together. Because, uh, and it may be the same person, or it may be different people, but, but, uh, there is that connection between forerunners as messengers and forerunners as wise master builders. Uh, he, in Iconium, this is Acts 14, 1 through 7. In Iconium, what did they do? They entered the synagogue uh, of the Jews and spoke in a manner that a large number of people believed. Okay, so what did he do? He, again, he went to the synagogue where the worshipers were gathered and he introduced a new thing. We see the same thing in uh, Thessalonica where um, it says here where there was a synagogue of the Jews and it says, and according to Paul's custom, according to his custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the scriptures and explaining, giving evidence that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead saying, the Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, is the Messiah that you've been awaiting. And so what was he doing? He again went where people were gathered, worshipers were gathered, and he introduced, he invited them into a new thing, into a new way. We see the same in uh, Acts 17, verse 10. Uh, the brethren immediately sent, uh, this is to Berea, uh, and he did the same thing. He immediately he went to the synagogue of the Jews and did the same thing. We see it the same in Corinth in verse, Acts 18, verse 4, where he was reasoning in the synagogue, uh, explaining to them. Uh, and then also in Acts 18, uh, verse 19, in Ephesus, uh, that he left them and now he entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So you, uh, I, I know it took a, a fair amount of time to kind of explain that and show you a lot of places in scripture but what I want to show, what I want the point I wanted to make was this was Paul's pattern this was his custom he first went as a messenger uh, into the synagogue into where worshipers were gathered now that doesn't mean we have to go into the synagogues but we go if you take it into today's situation we go into the churches we speak into people into Christians and as well as non-Christians but uh, where worshipers are gathered and bring a message from the Lord that calls them to awaken or to turn back to Christ or to what are the things that we talked about in prior sessions. We'll review them here in a minute. So we function as messengers. But you see, Paul also functioned as a wise master builder. So some of these uh, places that I've mentioned where he went first to the synagogues he also wrote letters to them. You know, First and Second Thessalonians, uh, First and Second Corinthians, the book of Ephesians, uh, the book of Colossians and uh, Galatians. Uh, you know, those, uh, actually, maybe not Colossians, but Galatians and Ephesians. Um, he wrote books to them. He spent a lot of time there. He said that he spent 18 months uh, in uh, Corinth teaching them, training and equipping the church. So what do we see? We see Paul going into where worshipers were gathered, functioning as a, as a messenger, inviting, confronting, 
And, and we'll go into some of these uh, modes that we can operate in as a messenger at the end of this message. But uh, he went in there, but his basic role was to invite them into a new way of relating to God, saying that Jesus was the Messiah, their Messiah, and that he, he and he crucified was the way in ter- to enter into the new way that God was relating in that hour. So he went as a messenger, and then what happened, for those who said yes, now you know, you know as you read through Acts that not everybody said yes to his message. I mean, some said yes, and uh, a lot of them said no. Uh, but for those who said yes, what did he do? He gathered those, and he taught them. He trained them. He equipped them. He explained to them how to function uh, in, in that role, in that, in that new thing, not role necessarily, but in that new expression of God's life. He explained to them how to do it. In addition to spending a lot of time with them, he wrote letters. He wrote a letter to First and Second uh, to the Thessalonians, two letters. He wrote letters to the Corinth. He wrote letters to the Ephesians. So, what do we see? We see him functioning first as a messenger, and for them, for those who said yes to his message, he functioned as a master builder, as a wise master builder. Uh, and so, we as end time forerunners. We are to do the, very, the same. We're to function as a messenger uh, and also as a wise master builder. Now, I want to make a couple points before uh, we move on. Uh, first, we know that Paul was an apostle. Uh, and he, as an apostle, he planted new churches. He planted churches all over Asia Minor, a number of new churches. But his apostolic ministry, in my opinion, was not as much about planting new churches as it was about planting new truths. He was planting a new truth. Now, when I, when I say a new truth, I'm not talking about something that's not in the Bible. I'm talking about a truth that is uh, scriptural, but is being unveiled to the people in a new way. His apostolic function was more about planting, uh, introducing people to Christ than it was about planting churches. Uh, now, I know, you know, different parts of the world is different, but in a lot of uh, places in the world, an apostle is one that plants a multitude of churches. Well, maybe so, maybe not. I mean, you may, people who plant a multitude of churches may just be church planters who may not be apostles, or they may be. But the apostolic function of Paul was more about introducing new truth. And so uh, wise master builders uh, equip and empower people to walk in these new truths. Uh, So uh, that was the first thing. The second point I want to make before we move on is that uh, not every... Not everybody will function both as a messenger and as a wise master builder. A lot of times it's a team, it's an effort. A forerunner ministry is an effort of multiple people. Some may have the anointing more as messengers to speak and to confront and to challenge and to uh, call forth, whereas others might be, their anointing might be more to teach and train on the how to's and, and to create the environment. That the, that the fruit might come forth of the new message. Both are very necessary. Uh, and one's not more important than the other, but not everybody has the gifting to do all, but some may, but uh, some may not. Some may, and some may have their role primarily and almost totally as intercessors and spiritual warriors, a very important aspect of that. So messengers and master builders could be the same person or it may be uh, different uh, people. Um, so anyway, end time forerunners have to have to function much like Paul did. Uh, they they must be messengers and master builders. Again, maybe not the same person, but that function needs to work uh, together. Uh, so let's talk now about some of the approaches of messengers of end time messengers. Um, End time messengers will speak on behalf of the Lord in a variety of ways. Uh, so 
it's not just one way that we will be a messenger. The function is to invite people into a new way uh, or even into a new season, but it, the tone may be different. Um, this is my preference. I mean, my preference is to, if possible, to speak softly and gently uh, into pe people, to speak the truth in love and compassion uh, and not to be hard, not to be strong, uh, but realizing that at times you have to do that. You have to be, as a messenger, you have to be strong. You have to be forceful. You have to, to, uh, to drop the plumb line, if you will, uh, in, into the, the setting, whatever that may be, in a very strong and very powerful way. You know, Paul wrote to, uh, in 1 Timothy, that he said, you know, if people continue in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may be fearful of sinning. And so, you know, Paul was not a, a, afraid of confronting people uh, in the situation that might be there. And, uh, you know, over the years of my functioning as a forerunner, uh, I've had to do both. My preference, uh, I don't like to confront people. I don't like to be hard. Uh, but I know at times it's been necessary. I remember uh, this was early on in our uh, ministry as a, as a church. Uh, the Lord had me to uh, change the way our seats were located. Rather than in rows, we put everybody in one big circle. And I, dropped, I had a plumb line from the ceiling. Uh, you know, the plumb line, the metal thing that, that lines up something straight uh, from the ceiling. And I spoke a message about the plumb line, about what God was calling us to do. And it was a very, uh, I don't, you know, it's been decades ago now, but I don't really remember exactly what I said other than uh, I know it was a hard message. And, um, uh, you know, I had forgotten about this actually, but uh, Judy, who's our worship leader, I had, was our worship leader uh, years ago, still part of the church, but uh, her son is actually the worship leader now. But um, she was saying, yeah, right after that, the entire worship team resigned, and it was her left. So it was a very confrontive thing, and, uh, you know, sometimes you have to do it. Uh, so, but the tone uh, is important. I th my, my pr approach is as a messenger, as positive and, and as inviting, uh, as much as we can, as gentle as we can, is a preferred tone for the messenger, realizing, though, that will not always work. Uh, and so there are definitely times when we have to be uh, tough. So anyway, we talked about uh, that tone. Now, now, before we move into there, I've got like, I think, seven or eight, if I got exactly the number, of different modes or approaches that forerunners as messengers use. But before I do that, I want to just review again what we're a messenger of. Uh, this is really from sessions two and three, but I want to make sure we don't get we don't lose the overall vision of what we're trying to do because of the trees. We don't want to miss the the forest for the trees. Um, so those five things that we talked about in session two that forerunners are to do: they're to turn hearts of the people back to the person of Christ. Forerunners turn people back to God's eternal purpose. And, and if you have forgotten all this, go back and look at session two in this class, and it goes into a lot of depth on that. Forerunners turn people from the focus on external things of God <clears throat> to an internal kingdom. Uh, forerunners turn the hearts of leaders to their spiritual children away from themselves and self-focus. And forerunners turn the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous. And so that's the purpose of why God's raising up forerunners. I mean, there are also times and seasons and things like that, but, they're, but the overall goal is to do that, to turn people back into his eternal purpose and all the things related to that. And we do that, session four dealt with this. The objective of those things is to turn people to these things, <coughs> excuse me, turn them for the purpose of preparing that mature corporate man, number one, 
Uh, number two, preparing people to stand in the pressures of the end times and to flourish there. And then number three, to prepare people, to make people, uh, people ready for eternity, those three uh, objectives. And so uh, we see that as messengers, our goal is to do this. Just like Paul, his message was to go into the synagogues and introduce Christ as the Messiah. Um, he probably used a lot of different words and a lot of different uh, ways of explaining it depending on the people and what God was saying to him. But the goal was the same, and that's where we are uh, as well. Uh, so with that, let's talk about some of the uh, approaches uh, that we will use as end-time messengers. Uh, the first one is that end-time messengers announce the second coming of Christ and times or events related to being prepared for his coming. There's a lot in that sentence. Let me just read it again. Messengers at first, they announce. Messengers announce. Uh, and they announce the second coming of Christ, that it's coming soon. Just like John the Baptist said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, we would do the same. Repent for Christ is coming soon. Uh, we don't date setters and we don't know when it is, but we know that times and events and circumstances and the witness of the Holy Spirit is that he is coming soon. So messengers announce the second coming of Christ uh, and also times or events related to being prepared for his coming. You know, just an example of times and events and to be prepared uh, you know, as we have entered into this decade of the 2020s, uh, I know the Lord really, at the beginning of the year, really put on my heart that this is going to be a different decade than we've encountered ever before in our lifetime, for sure, my lifetime. And it has been. It's been unbelievable, just some of the things that have happened uh, in this first year of this decade. And so... There are certain times and events and seasons that, that are happening related to God preparing his people <coughs> for the end times and for the second coming that are related to that. You know, maybe things of judgment coming upon the earth, maybe things of what God's saying in terms of preparing his people, the message that he's raising up, the, the work or anointing of the Holy Spirit that he is introducing. And so there's a lot of that. There's a mixture. There's, there's the, the overall message of turn to, call, turn to Christ because he is, he's coming soon. But there's also these secondary issues that are related to the second coming. And forerunners, as they are led you know, like we said in the last session, a voice from the throne as God speaks these things, they announce this type of thing uh, to uh, the church and to the people uh, of God. Um, so anyway, that, I think I, I was just looking at my notes to make sure. Uh, let me just read this one more scripture verse relating to announce. Um, Here's what Isaiah wrote about John the Baptist, and it pertains to end time forerunners too. It says, Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. In other words, get up on the mountain and announce and say, he's coming, he's coming, get ready. So that's the first mode is uh, that forerunners announce the soon coming of Christ and a lot of other issues related to that and to for, call people to make themselves ready. The second function is that end time messengers uh, invite believers, pastors, and the church in, in general into a fresh way of relating to the Lord so as to be prepared uh, be prepared for the end times, the second coming uh, of Christ uh, and eternity. Uh, that's, a, a, a long, again, a long sentence, but end time messengers invite 
uh, believers, pastors, and the church into a fresh way of relating to the Lord to be, so as to be prepared. Uh, you know, John the Baptist did this. In his messengerial role, he called on Israel to repent for the kingdom was at hand, just like we had mentioned earlier. He, what he was doing, he was inviting them to turn to a new way, to a new thing, inviting them into, into this. And that's what messengers do. I mean, they, they invite people into this new thing that God is unveiling to the church. And um, uh, we see the same with Paul in, when he, in his travels. We've already talked about that. But what did he do? He went to the synagogues and he invited them into a new way. And those who said yes, he worked with them and he taught them all about that. Um, so uh, that's the second uh, part is to invite. Uh, I'm just looking at my notes to make sure I don't miss anything. Okay, the next one, uh, end time messengers also reason and explain where the church is in error so as to persuade the church to accept the invitation of the messenger. Again, there's a lot in that sentence. In time messengers, they reason with people. It's not just one time, okay, I, I, repent because the Lord is coming back. And you go and that's all you say. What did Paul do and what do we do? We reason with people. We say, because they're going to argue, they're going to they're gonna say, oh, I don't agree with that. You know, we people have been saying that for g generations, centuries, and nothing's ever changed. And you know, you see, you, you know all the arguments. And so, I mean, there are time, there's a time when you just have to let people go, but there's a, the Lord may and probably will cause you to reason with people and to explain where the church is in, uh, is not being made ready so that people would understand, so they'll have understanding to, in order to persuade, persuade them uh, uh, to do that. Uh, let me just read this. This is Acts 17, 2 through 4. This is Paul again. And it says, And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ, the Messiah, had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, The, G the Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And some of them were were persuaded, some were persuaded, and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times it takes a while. He spent three Sabbaths here, but in Ephesus he spent three months, it says in Acts 18 and 19.8, reasoning with the Jews in the synagogue. So it's not just a one-time thing. I want to just make sure we understand that uh, you know, a lot of times you can think, okay, I'm doing the right thing. I go and I just drop a bomb. If you're a preacher, a pastor, you drop a bomb one Sunday uh, and that's all there is to it. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, we have to reason with people because, you know, our churches are filled with people who want God. And correctly so, they're not going to just accept every wind of doctrine that we may speak, and if we're introducing something that's different than what they are used to, we have to be willing to spend whatever time is necessary to reason with them so that they're persuaded. Now, this still doesn't equip them to walk in the new truths, but it gets them to the point where they're, they're saying, okay, I agree, this is a new truth. I'm willing to learn about it. I'm willing to, to be obedient to it. So teach me how to do it. Uh, and that may take a lot of time to do that. It may very well take a lot of time just to get them to the point where they say, okay, I agree. I say yes uh, to this. Um, so that's a, a major point. Now the next uh, point or next mode or approach that messengers use is that the end time messengers also speak in a way to create an expectancy in the hearts of believers for what is presently happening, happening and is coming in the future, to create an expectancy for these things. Again, not teaching them how, how to walk in them yet, but just to create an expectancy. Um, John the Baptist, this is about John the Baptist in Luke chapter 3, verse 15 through 17. Now, while the people were in a state of expectation, 
and wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ, uh, then he spoke uh, these things. So John's message and his, even his appearance on the scene created an expectancy uh, in the people that something was up, something was happening, something was different. Uh, because he went into the wilderness and many, many, many people came out to, to hear his voice. And so he was gathering crowds and there was an expectancy there. And for messengers, have, that's part of their role is to create an expectancy that things are coming and happening and are different. All right, the next one, the next, uh, again, approach that messengers function in is to, is this, that end time messengers also clarify misconceptions and they clarify lack of understanding related to Christ's second coming and the issues related to the end times uh, and to eternity. They clarify misconceptions and we mentioned this earlier in the message, but I want to mention it again. You know, John uh, the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God. Now, they were expecting, many of them were expecting a, a messianic figure to come on the scene to overthrow Roman oppression. And a lamb? And so what was John doing? He was clarifying. He, was, he, had, he clarified that he wasn't going to come uh, in, in his first coming as this one to overthrow uh, the sinful governments and the sinful culture. He wasn't coming to do that this time. He was coming as a lamb to die on a cross and to be resurrected. So he clarified uh, those things. Uh, I know in our own church, this was, uh, I've mentioned this a number of times in different uh, messages, but it was a very, it, probably the most, one of the most recent things where God came to us and invited us into something new. Uh, and it, it required a lot of clarification. When Terry Bennett came to our church for the first time in 2015, on that Saturday morning session, an angelic being came into the room. And I didn't see it, but I certainly felt the, the sense of holiness there in the room. And Terry said that, that we are being summoned to the golden altar. Um, and we had no idea what that was talking about other than he did mention that based on Revelation chapter 8, which you can look it up, and it's about the golden altar and the prayers of the saints. And so it took me a long time to kind of get clarity on it, understanding on it, but it sure took, it created a lot of questions in our people. And our, our people have a heart for God. They love God, but they don't want to just buy into every wind of doctrine either. And so it took a lot of explanation. It took, uh, I had to first figure out what he was saying to, first that I could kind of figure about, about it and then begin to teach on it. But what I was doing, I wasn't really at that point trying to teach us how to do to enter into the summons before the golden altar. I was just trying to uh, explain and clarify what it meant. Uh, and it took quite a while. It took, uh, really, it's taken years to kind of get a real clear understanding uh, of it. So messengers do that. They have to clarify misconceptions and lack of understanding as to how things uh, should operate, uh, whatever God might be saying. Now, a couple more, I think. The end time messengers will at times confront the church in order to awaken them to what God is saying to the church. Confront the church. Now, John the Baptist, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came out there and he said, you're a brood of vipers. Uh, and so that was not a sweet, gentle message. He confronted them and told them to repent and bring forth fruit inconsistent with, their, uh, with them. On that, so um, you know, sometimes you have to confront. I mentioned the the situation with the plumb line. Uh, that was a time of confrontation, and there have been others. I know when uh, there, the Lord called us a few years ago back to two years of training to be made ready, and it seemed like the first six months, every message that Brian spoke or I spoke 
was a message of confrontation, confronting the people. But, but it was in God's love, even though a lot, of time, a lot of the people didn't think it was in God's love. They thought we were uh, being hard and uh, un unnecessarily speaking to, to people. I mean, part of the problem in a church is you've got some who have already said yes to it, uh, and, but, you're, but God wants to bring the whole group in. And so it was, there was at least six months of hard messages, and we were confronting, but the purpose of the confrontation was to wake people up so that they would pursue these things. It, it was in God's grace, in his mercy, that he was having us speak these confrontive types of messages as messengers to wake them up so that they would come into all that God has for them. Um, now, I think this is the last one. The, the last one is end time messengers will also at times warn the church of the consequences of not responding uh, to the invitation of the messenger. Uh, sometimes there will be uh, warnings associated with this. Um, there's some scriptures in your notes. I won't go into those, but, but uh, there, there are times when warnings are, are there. Now, that probably is rare, uh, but there are times that we have to do that. I remember, uh, you know, I'm, I think most everybody who will watch this will, will know that we have the ministry in Africa that we've been ministering in for a uh, uh, you know, number of years now. And I, don't, I think it was 2016. I don't remember exactly the day, but not too long ago. Uh, we had our regional leaders. We had about 30. We have about 30 or so regional leaders. And we had them gathered in one location uh, and we're meeting with them for a week and training them and equipping them. Uh, and then it was one, one day there the Holy Spirit just came on me and I began to travail. Uh, really the only time I've ever, it's ever happened, uh, real serious travail. And, and I was just weeping and I couldn't, couldn't even speak. And, and uh, it was uh, really a shock to me and a real shock to me. And it was a shock to everybody in the room and then in the midst of the travail, I finally got to the point where I could actually get something out. Uh, and the Lord said, if, you're, if your goal in being a part of this group is anything other than to prepare a bride for Christ, leave now. Don't come back tomorrow. This was the end of one of the day, first day's session. And when I said that, I thought, oh, wow, I'm not sure. We may not have anybody come back. Um, but they all came back, thankfully. Uh, but it was a real warning. It was a real warning to that group that we're there for God. We're not there to, for them to have some uh, title or something that they can tell their friends about that they are part of an international ministry based in America or any kind of motivation for money or anything like that. They are there to prepare a bride for Christ. And if their motivation is anything else, it's not acceptable. It was a warning. Uh, to the people there. And there are times when that will be the case uh, with us as messengers. We will have to warn the people, if you don't say yes to this, there are consequences. And there have been other times we've had to do that, and messengers will have to do that. Uh, again, you're, you're, as a messenger, you may be leading a church or a congregation, and you'll be a messenger. You, God may send you to other churches, and you may do likewise. Or it may just be one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, not that you don't have to be a pastor or a leader uh, in the body of Christ to be a, to be a messenger. Very often, God will lead you into one or two or three people and uh, to speak these things. So, forerunners uh, must function uh, as messengers, as end-time messengers. It's a very important and a very powerful aspect of the forerunner call to be a messenger. So let's pray that God would uh, raise us up as forerunners who are end time messengers. And we do pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.